Hey everyone, thank you for joining me for episode 10 of The Green Life. Today's amazing guest is a world leading cardiologist and best selling author, Dr. Joel Kahn. Dr. Kahn is a lecturer as well who inspires others to think scientifically and critically about the body's ability to hear through proper nutrition. Dr. Khan is also a clinical professor of medicine at the Wayne State University School of Medicine in Detroit and is the founder of the Khan Center for Cardiac Longevity. His first book, The Whole Heart Solution, was the basis of a national public TV special. And I have here a book that I highly recommend called The Plant-Based Solution, which is a little Bible for cardiovascular health, including great recipes. This came really highly recommended by other guests I interviewed, such as Dr. Furman and Dr. Barnard, so get yourself a copy. Dr. Khan has been a vegan for 45 years, and he brought this lifestyle through his medical training and now into his practice. He was also voted by PETA as one of the sexiest vegan over 50, in good company with our friend Victoria Moran, who was here on the show a few episodes ago. So without further ado, welcome Dr. Khan. Hello Dr. Khan, thank you so much for joining The Green Life today, how are you? Good morning, I'm raising a glass of port to you. <laughs> nice one. <laughs> So people can't see you, but I am seeing you juggling on the little uh, treadmill. So that's awesome. You are exactly. adopting. It's actually morning in Michigan. And I'm not drinking port yet, even if you are in Portugal. And you're right. I walk a treadmill desk all day long in my medical office. So if you hear me uh, dragging my feet, I'm just walking like an old Portuguese man. Uh, that's awesome. And you do not look like an old Portuguese man. In fact, you don't look old at all. <laughs> so. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, well, I'm really excited to have you on because I, we're going to tap on to one of the most important subjects, which is cardiovascular health, which you're an expert about. And I really want to talk about the emphasis on prevention, especially in the wake of the two years that we had where um, this pandemic um, took over and um, the people that were most affected, affected were people that already had some underlying condition. So most people don't really know what um, health or cardiovascular health or disease really means? Can we give them a little intro in that? Yeah, absolutely. Because it isn't just one thing, although we work predominantly as an adult cardiologist on just a, a sh fairly short list. But, you know, there unfortunately are children born with holes in their hearts and other complex, it's called congenital heart disease. Uh, I might see them when they become adults, but there is a specialty of pediatric cardiology. Uh, all to itself, not something I deal with. Um, and, you know, it could be medicine, could be surgery, could be fatal, sadly. Uh, but then we move into, you know, teenage and adult years, and we start to deal with high blood pressure. That's considered a heart disease or cardiovascular disease. I would ask your listeners to promise to buy a home blood pressure cuff. Um, the number one killer in the world, according to data, is actually high blood pressure. And it's so easy to have high blood pressure and not know it. You have to have a cuff. You can feel fine and be 150 over 98. And 10 years later, you got an old brain and an old heart and old kidneys. And it's completely, you use the word prevention. I mean, we can work to prevent high blood pressure by all the things everybody listening knows they should do. Daily exercise, daily excellent diet, good sleep, avoiding excess alcohol, not smoking. Uh, body weight, attempting to keep it pretty normal. But still, there are other reasons to have high blood pressure. So get a blood pressure cuff or go to the fire station or go to the pharmacy and check your blood pressure pretty regularly. Doesn't matter what time of day. I I'm a big teacher of that. So that's one heart disease. Um, there are valve problems. They're not very common. Leaky valves, clogged valves. They can occur in young people like you, middle-aged people, older people not a big portion of the pie. And then you get to the big part, which is clogged arteries. And you know, obviously there's fancy words, atherosclerosis, hardening of the arteries. Uh, and we learned 50 years ago that we can explain a lot of clogged arteries. Again, how many people die every 40 seconds? Somebody has a heart attack in the United States every 40 seconds. So that's a lot of people where we're talking right now. And we learned it was smoking, diabetes, high cholesterol, particularly 
LDL cholesterol, high blood pressure, mom, dad, brother, sister having a heart attack. But there's at least 20 other causes of clogged arteries you can either ask about with questions like bad sleep and snoring and sleep apnea or men with erectile dysfunction. That's not causing the clogged artery, but it's a clue. Um, and then there's blood tests you can do. So prevention is a combination really of detecting a problem early, early. I mean, I have patients in my practice in their early thirties and I have to tell them your arteries are showing the beginnings of damage and I'm not gonna wait to your fifties and have a stroke. We're gonna institute a program now. So some of it is early detection and you don't need to do that for everybody, but that was a patient with a cholesterol of 400. So there was a reason to actually use an ultrasound and look at their arteries. So some of it is early detection, but prevention means never getting it. And that is something you can plan on by starting as early as possible. Healthy diet, healthy exercise, healthy weight, healthy sleep, don't smoke. Uh, we know the diet, the diet is Mediterranean diet or a whole food plant-based diet or the DASH diet, but still there is genetics. So I had a phone appointment with a very famous vegan author yesterday. And you know she was concerned that she could have heart disease. We're gonna figure it out. And she was almost embarrassed. How can a vegan for so many years ever be found to have heart disease? And I said, genetics matter. And, you know, never assume, even if you're good at all these things, diet, lifestyle, sleep, don't smoke, no, or moderate alcohol, even if you're doing it all, still get checked because uh, genetics are about 30% of heart disease. You know, you can inherit stuff that maybe for $100, you can do a blood test and find out if you got any of this stuff from mom and dad particularly if mom and dad had a heart event like stroke or heart attack early. But so it sounds complex. I literally need one visit with a patient with a relatively small investment in a couple blood tests and heart tests. And at any age, we can absolutely define where they stand for the next 10, 20, 30 years. And when you're on a standing treadmill desk, you really can tell where they stand, usually right next to me. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. <laughs> they should be standing on the treadmill with you. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing how many of the patients won't sit down for the hour appointment because they want to be in solidarity with, you know, some fitness and they wish they had a treadmill, but at least they're standing, you know, which is better than sitting, particularly if they had a long drive to come to my clinic. Absolutely. Um, so in terms of um, cardiovascular disease, what if um, someone does their blood test and their cholesterol is completely fine and then they find their, for example, homocysteine is too high? And homocysteine is, you know, correlated to uh, having strokes, most likely. Um, what would your approach be? Yeah, well, so first of all, you're asking a sophisticated, intelligent question. But it actually assumes that the audience knows what homocysteine is. And more important, that the healthcare professional knows to order it. Because unfortunately, it's one of 10, 12, 14 pretty important blood tests that get ordered very rarely, even in the American medical system and probably in the UK and Portuguese and other systems. So if you read about it, ask your doctor to check a blood test called homocysteine at least once. Under 10 would be a good result. 30 or 40 would be concerning that your diet, your metabolism, or your genetics are really off or your vitamin levels. Um, so if you do find it high, I'll usually do a blood test for the genetics, the MTHFR gene. Mm -hmm. can be a little pricey, although in my clinic, I can get it from a good lab for $50. So that's not too bad, no. US. And then I'm you know, going to have them reduce their red meat intake, maybe to nothing, because that helps. I'm going to put them on a B-complex vitamin, that's B12, B6, something called TMG, sometimes choline. Um, and make sure they are getting enough B12 and folate through supplements in the diet, a lot of leafy greens, and see if we can bring it down. You almost always can bring it down, but it can take a few steps. And it's probably a good idea for that stroke risk you mentioned. I mean, there's two real indications for using folate vitamins. One is in the pregnant mom to prevent uh, neural tube problems. It's called spina bifida. And then the other reason to consider prescribing folate vitamins 
and I say folate, not folic acid, because there's some clue that it's better to take the one that ends in A-T-E, folate, uh, will lower homocysteine and studies suggest prevent stroke to some degree. Amazing. Um, I'm, I'm asking because I see a lot of um, clients who actually are plant-based already. So by definition, their, plant, their, their, their food is actually good intake, uh, good quality, uh, but, and they take vitamins. So sometimes, I guess, the, the problem with homocysteine, if it happens, could be methylation, right? Um, which is what, why you would check the genetics, right? Yeah, if you wanted to prove that they inherited a very common genetic uh, uh, tendency to have a high homocysteine from their mom or dad, you do the blood test. You only got to do it once in your life because mm. genes don't change. The MTHFR gene, I politely call it the mother-father gene, but other people call it by other names, of course. Um, and I also see vegans with healthy diets, lots of leafy greens. And we know it's not too much meat. And we also know it's probably not too little folate, but they may need a little boost, like you say, with special folate called methylfolate, special B12 called methyl B12. And more and more, I'm using a vitamin called choline, which mm. my reputation is good for the brain, but it can get into the cycle that lowers homocysteine and help. It lowered my homocysteine quite a bit, actually. Amazing. Wonderful. Yeah, I saw some uh, supplements that are for homocysteine, which contain choline as well. So yeah, some do. Then, yeah, um, that's brilliant. So if somebody, I mean, you're an expert also in the approach of uh, tapping uh, heart disease uh, with, and cardiovascular disease with, um, with diet. And I, I believe you still have a wonderful cafe called Green Stakes. Um, uh, sadly... It wasn't a COVID casualty because we actually closed it a month before COVID hit, oh. but it was time to renew the lease very long term. And my family put their head down and raised our hands and voted yes or no. And we voted, we're going to let it go. It was just, you know, a hundred hours a week of work to operate a large vegan restaurant. Uh, it's sort of a good thing because you just can't staff a restaurant that large uh, anymore in the United States. It's just so hard to get a cook, a chef, a, a waiter, and a dishwasher. So uh, we saved ourselves personally a lot of stress. And fortunately, a couple really good carryout businesses have popped up that I refer clients, patients to, and they've filled the gap. Uh, but, you know, it's kind of eat at home food, which is oh. the best place to eat anyways. Yes, absolutely. I'm sorry about that. I didn't know. Um, but because I see so many posts of food when it comes to your page that I, I was convinced it was also a branch of the cafe. But in any case, anybody, you are an anybody's expert. Anybody's in the restaurant business, there's a very famous saying, the two best days are the day you open and the day you close. <laughs> <laughs> it, is, it is hard work every day. And it's like an orchestra, you know, one violin breaks a string and, you know, the pad tie comes out salty and everybody's upset. It's a yeah. tough business. It is. It is. It's true. I, um, I have a lot of friends who are restaurateur, especially in London, where when the whole vegan, um, you know, the vegan trend started and they started opening wonderful but stressful businesses and they were all restaurants. And you're right. You know, you can get amazing reviews and everything goes fine for the day and then one person can poop out. <laughs> whole day with one bad one right. um yeah it's definitely stressful and definitely stuffing was an issue so not just in the u.s um so in terms of well let's talk about food though because you're still an expert about it whether you have a cafe or not so what is your most recommended way uh, to eat and and also what would you suggest to people that want to change a diet to just uh, go for a health, heart healthy diet. And I don't mean heart healthy, like the American Heart Association defines, but like you define it. Well, you know, we really have so much data uh, that diet has an influence on preventing heart disease and about 20 other diseases, including many cancers and brain disease and kidney disease and uh, various uh, female uh, issues, polycystic ovarian syndrome, on and on. I mean, you can't have a healthy body with a junk diet. Don't plan on that. No, we can't cure every illness with diet, but we can help almost everyone. And more and more prostate disease, prostate cancer, erectile dysfunction. And there's no question, like there's a large study 
um, involving tens and tens of millions of people funded by the Gates Foundation called the Global Burden of Disease Study. They're in 190 countries. They assess the diet of tens of millions of people, and they have the ability to follow up how they're doing. They just published in the last few weeks the three foods that promote longevity. And it was important, like get an extra six, eight, 10 years of life and the two foods that shorten lifespan. What were they? It's not a surprise to us that eat the way we eat, but number one on the list was beans. More beans, longer life. That's not the first time it's been shown, but the other study was a thousand people and this study was tens of millions. Mm -hmm. Number two was nuts, more nuts, longer life. And we're not talking salted honey, Peanuts, just raw nuts, uh, walnuts, pecans, cashews, uh, Brazil nuts. They're all great ones. And the third was actually whole grains. And a lot of people say, I thought that was gluten and it's going to kill you. Eh, gluten doesn't kill you um, unless you're celiac or really have some other sensitivity going on in your gut from some problem. But that was the result. What were the two foods that shorten your lifespan? Red meat in general, and strongly more so processed red meat, bacon, pepperoni, hot dog, corned beef, and the rest. So, I mean, how many other studies have shown the same thing? But when you have 190 countries, 3,000 researchers, and tens of millions of people, it's powerful. So uh, that was, you know, a recent statement. And so you got to eat somewhere between the Mediterranean diet, which is tons of vegetables and fruits and grains some nuts, particularly if you follow the Loma Linda version of the diet, because they're famous for their nut intake. Um, somewhere between the Mediterranean diet, where you might eat fish a couple of times a week and not red meat, you don't use uh, necessarily butter and lard and ghee, you might use extra virgin olive oil, sit around with your family, have a glass of low alcohol red wine that you make in your own home, things like that. All the way to completely whole food, plant-based, like taught by Dr. Ornish, Dr. Esselstyn, Dr. Furman, Mr. Pritikin, Forks Over Knives, you know, many, many examples. And something that I've eaten for 45 years, I've been completely plant-based since I was 18. And it's been a very good random decision long ago in college to do that and never went back. So um, yeah, obviously you can survive without an animal product. I do take proper vitamin supplementations and check the levels like the B12 and the vitamin D and a little iodine and a little selenium, or you can eat Brazil nuts, but you can do perfectly fine uh, with a whole food plant-based diet. So make it colorful, make it crunchy, get a ton of fiber. If you want to mess up now and then, I mean, I'm not looking at your plate, but don't do it very often. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, in terms of fat, Let's talk about fat because uh, this is a controversial subject. So um, there are a lot of uh, studies that show a plant-based, whole food, plant-based, low-fat diet is more beneficial for certain things. And then, of course, we have to, fats are very beneficial for things like heart, heart health or brain health. So what is the balance here? And But also, is there a difference between taking whole fats and then refined um, oils such as even olive oil? Yeah, so for the general population, your general listenership and the rest, I think the most important observation, not a perfect observation, was made long ago, maybe over 50 years ago, by a researcher in Minneapolis who's famous, sometimes said to be notorious, Dr. Ansel Keys, K-E-Y-S, Ph.D., lived to over 100 is credited for having taught America what the Mediterranean diet was because he spent a lot of time in Italy in the early 1950s. And then he bought a home just south of Naples and lived uh, half a year in Italy, half a year in Minnesota. You don't want to live all year in Minnesota if you can get the heck out of there in the winter. <laughs> um, but he made an observation. In the 70s or late 60s, people in Finland ate 40% of their calories in their diet from fat. People in the island of Crete ate 40% of their calories from fat. There were nearly no heart attacks described by doctors in Crete. And yet Finland had the highest heart attack rate in the world, 40% of calories from fat. And a lot of animal research, a lot of human research, and then some prospective uh, data called the seven country study said it's not all fats, 
it's predominantly saturated fat, which is almost exclusively a uh, animal-based choice. Uh, thinking of cheeses, thinking of a red marbled meats, but there's saturated fat in turkey, pork, fish, chicken for sure. Um, and uh, the one you have to watch out in the plant-based world is palm oils and coconut oils uh, because they are plant derived foods that happen to be very high in saturated fat. But his data in scientific labs, his data in epidemiology experiments was, if you reduce your saturated fat by eliminating a lot of your animal products, you will end up with a very healthy diet and just keep it very plant forward. So a walnut has very little saturated fat, an olive has very little saturated fat, an avocado has very little saturated fat. They have other fats, monounsaturated, polyunsaturated, that are generally felt to be quite healthy. So it doesn't have to be a ultra low fat diet to be healthy. It can be. There is the real life example in Okinawa, Japan, that it's a very low fat traditional diet. It's changed since the 50s and 40s. But at the time, people had exceptional longevity without a lot of fat in their diet. But then the people of Greece had, particularly in Icaros, Greece, Icaria, one of the blue zones, had a rather high fat diet and had good longevity, but make them what we like to call healthy fats. And that's not pepperoni and it's not coconut oil in your coffee. No, absolutely. But you also mentioned um, olives and avocados, which are whole fats. What about oils? How do you feel about them? So there has been a tradition. I'm a cardiologist and there's a tradition going back to a Dr. Morrison in Los Angeles in the 1950s and a Mr. Pritikin in California in the 70s and Dr. Dean Ornish and Dr. Esselstyn that maybe the best heart disease reversal diet for sick people is a plant diet that's without oil and as low in fats as possible. And that's been tested and it works. But recently in Spain, there's something called the Cordioprev trials, C-O-R-D-I-O-P-R-E-V, and they're testing in Spaniards with heart disease, and they don't have small data. They have more than a thousand people being followed very carefully. They've given them a high olive oil Spanish diet and a low olive oil Spanish diet. And actually the high olive oil Spanish diet is proven to be more heart protective. They've even shown it to be helping to reduce bumps and plaques in the arteries to the brain called carotid arteries. They've done some really interesting science that it seems to be very good for the lining of your artery called your endothelium. And you know, when you have a study 25 years ago of 20 volunteers, and you have a study in Spain in 2022 of 1,005 people with heart disease, and one shows olive oil is healthy and another one questions it, it's pretty darn hard to ignore that giant database out of Spain. So I am, uh, I have taught my patients to be a bit more relaxed about high quality extra virgin olive oil, drizzled on some grilled vegetables, drizzled on a salad. We're not frying food and you wouldn't want to really use olive oil anyways to fry food. You can use it to saute food, but you know, be reasonable. Um, you don't, and my wife doesn't like it. She doesn't eat olive oil. I like, I have a collection of European olive oil that's reported to be super healthy. You know, there's a lot of reasons olive oil. It contains a chemical called hydroxytyrosol, oleocanthal, oleopurin. These have been studied. They're extremely powerful plant-based chemicals, kind of like sulforaphane is the famous chemical in broccoli sprouts and broccoli. So uh, olive oil is not without a ton of science. There's a lot of it. No, I agree. But I also, I think also the quality is important. As you said, you have high quality uh, olive oil. And um, the problem with a lot of store-bought olive oils is that they're not really what they seem to be. And I think this has maybe also caused a lot of the problems when it came to data. Um, when they were looking at what people were consuming, it's quite possible people weren't actually consuming a pure olive oil, but you know, knockoffs. Right. So I like to know my olive farmer. And if I can't know who it is, I've got to trust a little bit of research, you know, uh, and it's probably not going to be a $5 bottle of olive oil. 
probably going to be a $22 bottle of olive oil in a dark glass, tightly sealed uh, jar that uh, tells when it was made, you know, 2021 harvest, where it was made, Portugal, a great olive oil, great, great olive oil. But Greece, Italy, Spain are the biggest producers. And they tend to, they don't usually have organic symbols on them, but they don't use much Roundup in those countries. So you can be pretty sure you're not getting uh, a product that's tainted too badly with environmental toxins. Yeah. How do you actually, that you're segueing the next question perfectly. What do you feel environmental factors have to do with our heart health? Yeah, it's huge. Maybe one of the biggest is actually mercury from fish. It's very sad that fish, although you can talk about depleting the waters and uh, the environmental consequences and killing dolphins and all the other horrors, but theoretically fish flesh could be healthy. There is saturated fat. It is part of the traditional Mediterranean diet in limited amounts, but it's mercury and uh, fish are very good at concentrating toxins like uh, BPA, BPS, PCB, PFAS, all these chemicals. And these are the real deal. These are causing kids to have early periods and uh, causing uh, thyroid and sexual and fertility issues. They're sometimes called xenoestrogens, xenoestrogens, um, and they're everywhere. Our standard blood test in my clinic is a blood mercury level. And I am in a reasonably comfortable affluent area where people are buying at the better grocery stores, the eating at the better restaurants. My patients are loaded with mercury and it's usually tuna fish or a lot of raw sushi fish. And it's a real toxin for the heart as well as the brain and the kidneys. So we work to change the habits, use certain natural agents like chlorella, uh, to get the mercury levels back to normal. Uh, it also can cause your blood pressure to be high. So sometimes the blood pressure will be improving when you identify and uh, lower the mercury. And yeah. that's just one example, but it's our whole polluted world. I'm not a fan of city tap water. I'd like you to have a little simple filter at home. Uh, if you can, you don't have to spend a lot of money, but I don't trust... Uh, even though my city of Detroit is a reputation of reasonably good city water. You know, we also had the city of Flint, Michigan, an hour north of us that had the terrible lead in the water tragedy. And uh, there's lead in the water where I live. I mean, it's, it's, it's measurable. So we have, we have polluted the place we live. Not a very good plan. No, absolutely not. Um, yeah. What about, uh, I actually came into reading some really good research about uh, heavy metals in, dent in, in dental practices and, um, and brain health, but have you read anything, and I didn't really research if it had any problems with the heart, but I would guess considering the heavy metals problem, you think that people should check into their filler, fillings and check in their oral health before, if they have heart issues, if they want to prevent them? Well, yeah, definitely, you know, paying attention to oral health, gum health, uh, cracked teeth, root canals that may have gone bad and be harboring hidden infection um, are very tightly connected to um, many organs, brain health, sexual health. There's a connection between gum disease and um, erectile dysfunction and certainly also heart health. It's just a common place of hidden infections and uh, inflammation as a root place. So brush your teeth, floss your teeth, water pick, go to your dentist, get examined. Whether you should remove your um, silver fillings or not is you know, a matter for everybody to consider. Um, and you probably need to go to a special dentist if you're going to do it. Uh, I've not done it. I had so many silver fillings as a kid, I'd have to literally rework my whole mouth. I still got my wisdom teeth. They've got fillings. So, I, you know, of course I replace them when there's a need, but I've not gone to a biological dentist and had every single one removed, but my mercury levels and my other ways you can check mercury so far have been normal. So I haven't really been pressed to do it, but uh, if, you know, somebody is vegan and they're not eating fish and they check their tap water and they still have a high 
mercury level in their urine and their hair and other places you could check it, uh, the teeth should be examined very carefully. Yeah, good call. Can you do home exams for heavy metals like with strips, like we do with pH? Are you aware of um, any? I'm not. You have to. It's not just a dipstick. You would do more like a. There's a way you can just uh, pee in a cup and get a urine mercury level. Some of the functional med doctors, as you know, will then give a medication called DMSA and recheck the urine in six hours. And you very often see a flood of mercury coming out if you provoke it. It's called a provoked urine. And other people think the best way is to send a hair sample in. And you can do that fairly inexpensively. Do you clip a few hairs, put them in an envelope and send them to a lab and you get kind of a long term. Like when I check a blood level, it'll be high if somebody ate mercury rich tuna fish the last few days. But if they, for some reason, didn't eat fish this week, but had it two weeks ago, it may not show up. The hair will show it. Um, yeah. Have you, um, have you read anything about gut health and, and heart health? So your microbiome uh, variety um, and your heart health, and if they are correlated. I know with, um, there is a big correlation with fiber, which feeds the good bacteria, and, uh, and heart health. But do you know if the variety and the numbers of good bacteria in our gut also have that correlation? Uh, it's an evolving field. And I don't think there's a simple answer today. The strongest example is that a chemical was identified in the blood of humans 11 years ago called TMAO. A T like Thomas, M like Mary, A like apple, O like orange. And if you eat a lot of meat and egg yolk, the bacteria in your gut may metabolize it. And all of a sudden in your bloodstream, you have a chemical that the last 11 years of science, now more than a thousand papers, suggest may harm your arteries, your kidneys, your heart, maybe your brain, uh, and maybe be predictive of a shortened lifespan. It's a pretty important marker. It's an available blood test, TMAO. I've probably drawn it 10,000 times in the last seven years it's been available. That's the strongest example. And recently at the Cleveland Clinic, they identified at least one bacteria never heard of it before, that uh, maybe the, uh, the bacterial strain that creates TMAO uh, through its pathway through the gut and then the liver. Um, because vegans don't eat red meat and egg yolk, they're almost always super low in TMAO. There are some other ways to raise it. If you drink a lot of energy drinks with carnitine, if you take a lot of vitamins with choline, and I told you I take choline, yeah. and some of my patients do, but I check their blood levels to make sure I'm not raising their TMAO level. My level did not go up. I probably don't have those bacteria. Right now, there's not a known probiotic or anything particular to lower TMAO. You change your diet if you believe this is important. Um, in the future, there will be probably uh, natural substances along with prescription drugs to lower TMAO and change the gut microbiome. We're still learning. The Mediterranean diet seems to help it. Balsamic vinegar may be part of the reason. The Mediterranean diet seems to lower it, um, but we're still learning. Another reason to eat little or no red meat and little or no egg yolk overall, besides all the other reasons we talked about. Yeah. You seem to be very um, accommodating and inspiring to your patients. Like when you're not, you know, not very like no red meat. Or no, you, you're just actually guiding people to be mindful about the amounts. Um, that, and considering that you've been vegan for 45 years, that's quite uh, something. Uh, what prompts you to have this approach versus a complete no-no? Um, well, it, it, with my patients, it's practical. Uh, I'm trying to suck them in, <laughs> you know, baby steps. There's a lot of people that the idea of oatmeal for breakfast, salad for lunch, bean soup for dinner is a long way away from what they're eating. Mm -hmm. So I'm happy just to get them to eat an apple, a salad, maybe make their first smoothie ever in their life. And, you know, just inch towards it and see where it goes from there. Yeah, I hear you. Can you um, give me one day of um, 
eating according to Dr. Khan. So yeah. a little bit of inspiration. I actually usually, not for any plan, I usually have coffee and don't eat breakfast. Um, I'm not a big believer in that. It's just the way it works out. Uh, I broke that this morning. I actually had a bean enchilada without any cheese on it that was in the refrigerator because I was hungry after a workout. It was a very good, healthy meal with lots of Mexican spices, but that's unusual. Uh, at least I get to walk the treadmill all day to make up for that. <laughs> I am a big fan of a researcher on nutrition called Dr. Longo in Los Angeles, uh, Walter L-O-N-G-O. Mm -hmm. And he is a world expert, probably the world expert on variations in fasting for health or supporting uh, the absence of disease. And um, he has a bar called a fast bar, F-E-S-T, that has some amazing science that you can have this small nut-based bar and not break your ketosis and not raise your blood sugar until you eat at lunch. So I will sometimes do that. So it's a little small, healthy snack, science-based, but kind of gives me a little bit of that time-restricted eating without completely being fasted in the morning. It's a trick, but it's been scientifically shown to work. Lunch, I always bring, it's probably more than a big salad. If it's a salad, there's going to be lots of beans and mushrooms and uh, the tea bombs <laughs> from Dr. <laughs> Ferman. <laughs> yeah, but it might be ethnic food, lentils, hummus. My wife's quite an accomplished cook um, just by the 45 years we've been doing this together. Mm -hmm. And um, it might be we have some of these plant-based organic healthy takeouts. And I will occasionally bring a uh, wonderful meal from Earth Meals, U-R-T-H meals.com. That is right up the street from my office. Love it. And I don't own it, but I'll give a shout out. And then um, dinner, I'd say, you know, during the pandemic was 365 days a year at home. Now I know the restaurants in town once in a while to go out and have a vegan risotto or a vegan pasta with lots of vegetables and tomatoes. But usually it's at home. Uh, it could be a lentil loaf, could be a bean chili, uh, could be baked potato salsa with a salad. It's always a pretty large salad with sprouts, a lot of purple cabbage. Mm. Started doing that at the beginning of the pandemic, purple, chopped purple cabbage raw in every salad. It makes it so pretty, but it's one of the healthiest foods on the planet. Uh, you know, and then very few sweets. I have a sweet tooth, but very few and certainly no soda. I drink coffee, tea, water, occasionally a sparkling one. How do you feel about coffee and blood pressure? Uh, generally unrelated. Some of it is genetics because I know from my genetic tests, I metabolize caffeine quickly. And um, that's a uh, advantage because I can have one or two cups and it's just going to be broken down quickly. There are other people that uh, either know from just their sensation or they know from maybe having the same 23andMe genetics that they metabolize coffee slowly and uh, they are at uh, some risk of little raise in heart rate, blood pressure. So overall, the data is pretty darn clear that coffee is a healthy choice for most. Um, but um, if you don't feel good, don't drink it. If it bothers you, don't drink it. It gives you heartburn, don't drink it. Yeah, listen to your body. And... Yeah. Um, Absolutely. That's really important anyway. So last question, I know you're really busy. So uh, what about stress? Can stress really wipe out all the good efforts that people may make? Like say someone wakes up in the morning, uh, has a workout, eats the best food, but they just live the stressful, whether it's emotional or just a very practically stressful life. Can you, do you believe that that correlation is so high that can really wipe out all the efforts that diet and exercise lifestyle can make? Um, it is a big deal. Um, uh, and we all have it. We've had more of it in the last two years on average, and it doesn't seem to be letting up too much. Um, and we need strategies and we need, you know, good sleep and good food and breathing and yoga and meditation and Tai Chi and community and friends and support. Um, but you know, when you're stressed, you don't, go to the gym and you grab a pizza and you eat the donut and you know, you're, you're not as mindful about all these health efforts. Plus 
stress itself can raise your blood sugar, your cortisol, your cholesterol. So um, I use a lot of herbal support. That's a cop out. Some ashwagandha, rhodiola. I like that. Feels good. My patients think it feels good. It's very safe. Mm. There's a little data that ashwagandha is also very good for erectile dysfunction, which I deal with a lot in my clinic. So it's a win-win. Um, you know, do some yoga every day, mindful, um, but keep an eye on your stress level and get your blood pressure cuff and check it. Cause when you're stressed, your blood pressure goes up. Yeah, absolutely. That's one factor for sure. Um, the, um, actually we have three more minutes, so I'm going to, I'm going to really milk them <laughs> in right. a vegan way. Um, so a little question that is really per- per- pertaining to the last two years. So. A lot of people uh, that um, whether that took the procedures that have been uh, mandated um, might have myocarditis. With whether that that's happening a lot in children, but it's happening also in adults. The younger it seems to be more prominent. If that's the case for some of the listeners that might have taken the solution provided, what would you suggest? What would you suggest to? keep it in yeah. check if they may say we went to the hospital, but they've been discharged, but they want to really, you know, keep an eye on their hearts. Well, you know, for people that have been partially fully vaccinated with the COVID vaccine, um, myocarditis, a relatively rare condition in general and debatable how many cases, some data suggests there's been tens of thousands of cases in the United States. Our government doesn't uh, indicate quite the, actually it's a government database that says that, but our government officially doesn't say that. So it's controversial and I don't want to get too controversial right now, but, um, uh, it generally occurs with on the second injection in adolescent or younger men between 18 and 30 to 40. And, um, it's usually occurring within four, you know, within the first week after, uh, sometimes the first, usually the second vaccine could be the booster. So if you had the vaccine six months ago, you're, you know, you're not really too worried about myocarditis. Yeah. There's a database I'm looking at that says there's 36,000 cases in the United States of myocarditis reported to our CDC. The CDC may or may not agree, but it's sort of derived from their own database. Um, so it's a controversial point. It's probably underreported. Um, if you had myocarditis, you know, you probably have seen a cardiologist if you've been admitted and they may have advised you to limit your exercise, follow the strength of your heart by EKG and echo, maybe some medicines, maybe some vitamins. I like coenzyme Q10 a lot, a very safe vitamin that is widely available and helps support healthy blood pressure, healthy heart function. So these are all choices that people can make, but I hope, and of course, there is myocarditis after COVID, you know, respiratory infection. But same thing, if it's occurred and resolved and you had COVID a year ago and maybe some evidence of myocarditis that you've been checked, it should be one and done. It shouldn't come back and bite you again. Okay, that's ensuring. Brilliant. Well, uh, Dr. Khan, can people... um have tele tele consultations with you at this point i don't have any patients in portugal i definitely have patients in london and i have patients in israel and india and uh australia all of mexico and a whole lot of the united states i'm licensed in many 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 states yeah they just reach out to my clinic con k-a-h-n longevity center.com and pretty much everything you need to get some more information is there Brilliant. We, I will put everything in the show notes and I really want to thank you. I know you are extremely busy and I will let you go back to your patients and I'm really, really um, grateful that you took the time to speak to me. Super kind of you and thank you and uh, you asked some brilliant questions. It was a total pleasure. You're welcome. Have a great, great day. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Khan, and thank you, everyone, for staying with us today. It was a shorter episode only because Dr. Khan is super busy with his practice, and I'm really grateful he made the time for us. But still, this episode is full of golden nuggets, so I urge you to get yourself books and training with Dr. Khan on his website. All the details will be in the show notes. And for now, if you have enjoyed this episode, please do give us a thumbs up, share it, review it, and help us grow, and I'll see you next time. Oh,